In 2021, the EU announced the Global Gateway, a global infrastructure program with 150 billion euros earmarked for Africa. The stated goal, building key infrastructure, creating jobs, accelerating the green transition, and rekindling the EU's relationship with Africa. The European Union wants to be Africa's partner of choice. However, on top of these goals, the EU is financing border security, coordinating military training missions, and several of its member states are engaged in military operations across a continent in which its influence runs deep. Yet it's an influence that is being diluted with the arrival of new actors who are also investing significant financial and military resources. So what is the EU really doing in Africa? And can it compete with its rivals across the continent? Ties between Africa and Western Europe have existed for centuries, although they haven't been particularly equal. First, there was the slave trade with African kingdoms, which fueled the plantation economy of the New World. After that, Europe colonized much of the continent in the 19th century as part of the so-called scramble for Africa. This left a legacy of exportation that is still visible on much of the continent. African economies still focus mainly on resource extraction, in part for the European market. The borders of its countries reflect neither geographical or ethnic boundaries, but colonial divisions. And some countries still function under institutional remnants of colonialism in the form of the CFA franc in West Africa, which gives France control of the monetary policies of some of its former colonies. Europe, as a result of this long and complex history, has been the main actor for the past several decades in terms of security, trade and aid. But that influence has seen a relative decline. The countries that make up the European Union made up nearly two thirds of Africa's trade in the 1960s, which was down to 28% in 2011, and 33% today. New actors like China and Russia, which have captured headlines, but also countries like India, Turkey, Israel, Brazil, Indonesia, or Japan, have increased their presence on the continent and are offering alternative trade, security, and investment deals. This has pushed Europeans and African leaders to rethink the EU's approach and influence in Africa. We can no longer continue to make policy for ourselves, in our country, in our region, in our continent, on the basis of whatever support the Western world or France or the European Union can give us. So we can ask ourselves, what are the EU's priorities on the continent? But before we talk about the European Union's priorities, we need to discuss what should be one of your own, having secure internet access. And that is something the sponsor of this video, Private Internet Access, could help you out with. Private Internet Access is a VPN provider that allows you to reroute your data through another server. It means that you can change your virtual location to nearly anywhere in the world. With Private Internet Access, you can even take it to the next level, choosing to switch your geolocation not only to another country, but to any of the US's 50 states. While helping safeguard your online privacy by blocking ads, trackers, and malicious websites, it also makes it possible to stream videos or websites that are only available from a certain location. All you have to do is turn on the VPN and refresh your web browser, and it'll show you to be in the new location. If you're looking for a VPN and want to support into Europe, check the link in the description for an 82% discount on private internet access with three extra months completely for free. Now back to the video. The EU's actions in Africa can be understood as part of six interrelated and overlapping priorities. First, the European Union needs African minerals to power its industries. 40% of French uranium comes from this mine in Niger, and Africa has large deposits of materials essential for the energy transition, like copper, cobalt, or platinum. At the same time, companies based in the European Union are the largest investors in African fossil fuels. To help in part with its access to those raw materials, the EU has granted preferential trade agreements with much of the continent, allowing African countries to export goods, including commodities, tariff-free. Europe is also looking for new export markets, with Africa's population set to double by 2050, and parts of the continent becoming increasingly wealthy, it's set to become an important market for EU manufactured goods. As Africa integrates economically itself, like with the signing of the African Free Trade Agreement, access to African markets will be simplified, making it the next frontier of growth for many businesses. Then there is the EU's ambition to be a regulatory superpower, and set the rules for industry worldwide, giving its own companies an edge in the process. For example, this high-speed train line in Morocco, built by a French company, was done so to EU standards. By trading and investing with Africa, the EU also exports its global standards, particularly on sustainability, 
which will facilitate access to the continent's markets for European companies. Since the 2015 migration crisis, a major focus point has been controlling migration from Africa, from which roughly a third of the migrants to the EU are from. As migration has become a politically toxic topic in many EU member states, the EU's aid to Africa has become conditional on alignment with the EU's migration policies and values. And through a policy instrument called the EU Trust Fund for Africa, it has invested in both job creation to eliminate poverty, one of the root causes of migration, and border security investments to stop it altogether. Then, the EU is engaged in tackling instability in the continent, which is a major driver of migration. It also has to do with securing its investments in the region and containing an isthmus hotspot at Europe's doorstep. Since 2013, a European task force led by France has been fighting a counterinsurgency in the Sahel at the request of local governments, and the EU has coordinated training missions for the African countries involved. Initially, these aim to stop the toppling of governments, but they have morphed into capacity-building missions to enable African countries to defend themselves, albeit with mixed success. And finally, there is diplomacy, as a way to push the EU's visions and values, which translates into support for its initiatives at the United Nations. In 2020, most African nations voted against a Western-backed resolution condemning China's treatment of the Uyghurs. Or in 2022, where many African countries abstained from condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The backbone of this presence is economic involvement. The EU is the largest aid donor, trade partner, and investor in Africa. But EU investment has remained stagnant in recent years, despite growing needs from Africa. According to the African Development Bank, the continent needs 68 to 108 billion dollars annually until 2030 to fill its infrastructure needs. That gap between the needs of Africans and the European Union is what allowed China to build a presence on the continent, providing loans where the EU would not. What's more, China accepted greater risk, ignored political situations, and unlike the EU, didn't concern itself with human rights. China not only financed infrastructure projects, but also brought along the know-how on how to build them. According to this report by The Economist, there are roughly 200,000 Chinese workers in Africa, in mines and in construction projects. These deals have been praised by some African leaders for the all-in-one package deals on infrastructure and resource extraction. Our partnership with China is one that is mutually beneficial, that is based on win-win. And we are very grateful to the Chinese government, to the Chinese people, for the support that they continue to render. Yet the harsh terms of these deals, which would give China the right to seize infrastructure in case of failed payments, have also been criticized. The Tanzanian president has said that only a mad person would accept their terms. But for lack of any alternative, other African countries have followed suit and signed deals with China. China's push for digital infrastructure as part of its digital Silk Road has allowed it to make inroads on the continent, spreading its own standards in the process. For example, Senegal is adopting Chinese digital practices. And companies like Huawei and StarTimes have also been able to gain a foothold from which they can now continue to expand commercially. And China has received preferential access to the continent's raw materials. Russia also found a similar gap. While European countries refused to sell weapons to African nations, it developed security partnerships in much of Africa, selling weapons, military expertise, and mercenaries in exchange for mining rights. Russian presence, coupled with the mixed success of French and European military missions, which are increasingly perceived as colonial endeavors rather than stabilizing operations, and a series of Russian-backed coups, have led to a falling out of European countries with local governments, particularly in Mali and in the Central African Republic. European and French troops have been either kicked out or withdrawn, leaving gaping holes in the Sahel as a regional security cooperation. So in face of these new actors, what is the EU's plan? When it comes to investment choices, they are currently relatively limited. And the few options that exist too often come with a lot of small print. In order to address its priorities and compete in Africa, the EU has unveiled Global Gateway. While the plan is mostly a recycling of EU funds and already pledged funds by member states, it aims to tackle one of the EU's main problems, the lack of all-in-one packages of the same scope as China's. China has a huge benefit from offering packages, for example, like 
uh, internet deals. The European Union doesn't really have that, it doesn't really offer that, which means like each company has to go there individually. It's just not a competitive package. For example, Global Gateway would make it possible to combine an Italian mining deal with a Dutch infrastructure and Polish housing project in Africa to create a single convenient EU package that can compete with integrated Chinese proposals. On top of its ability to combine the offerings of the EU's member states, it serves as an extension of another key EU policy, the European Green Deal. It will invest around the world to support our priorities, that is the green and the digital transition allowing its companies to benefit from renewable energy projects in Africa on top of the European Union and spreading EU standards in the process. But ultimately, this is about solid economic foundations and providing jobs for the 10 to 12 million people entering the African labor force every year. But despite this initiative aiming to rebalance the EU's relationship with Africa, there are significant contradictions between some of the EU's policies. For example, those aimed at resource extraction and those aimed at job creation. Let's look into two policies previously mentioned in the video, the EU Trust Fund for Africa and the Preferential Trade Agreements. While the former aims to target the root causes of migration, in part through job creation, the trade agreements limit African countries' ability to move up the value chain and away from commodities, creating jobs in the process. Similarly, the EU is perceived as hypocritical. It's hard to promote green technologies and ask countries to become more sustainable when it's the largest investor in fossil fuel extraction across the continent. One of the EU's main challenges is to rebalance its relationship with Africa by resolving the contradiction of its policies. But there is a structural obstacle to this. Contrary to China, Russia, or the United States, priorities are not united between countries and with the EU. In 2019, former Italian Interior Minister Luigi Di Maio criticized France for growth-limiting policies in its former colonies, which subsequently contributed to migration. And for many EU countries, involvement in Africa is simply not a priority. But with climate change set to affect Africa and the specter of mass migration, the EU is in a hurry to help create societies that are wealthy and resilient enough to cope with the changes. The EU also still has unanswered questions about how to deal with security in the Sahel with its incomplete apparatus. And European countries, and by extension the EU, have a major reputation problem due to their legacy of colonialism. Particularly since up until now, the countries most involved have been the former colonizers of France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Belgium, and to a lesser extent Germany and the Netherlands, rather than the whole of the EU. And it's a sentiment that is capitalized upon other potential partners for Africa, like in this propaganda cartoon by Russia, portraying the West as hyenas. For all of its priorities, the EU seems like the actor with the most urgent interests in seeing Africa develop, and offering it the fairest deal. For that, it has to distance itself from a legacy that is heavy in history and whose institutions still weigh on African countries. But that is a story that has yet to unfold. This was Into Europe. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for the latest updates and analysis on European news. If you want to learn more about Europe's need for critical raw materials, then watch this video. And I'd like to say a special thank you to Guamaca, Svenja, Yuri, and Ruben for their help in making this video.